Praise the Lord, saints. Once again, I want to say thank you for coming out to uh, share time with us uh, once again as uh, we attempt to do the right thing. I want to welcome you to Do the Right Thing, whose uh, founder and pastor is Pastor Shirley Wharton. I'm your host, Ronnie Stevens. I'm Minister Ronnie Stevens. I'm from New Beginning Seasons. I'm from New Seasons Ministry, excuse me, but my pastor is Pastor Daniels. Uh, you can continue to watch us do the right thing every Sunday morning from 8 to 8.30 a.m. on Comcast TV 20. Or you can look us up on your computer on bgntv.gospel.com 24-7 is brought to you by the Bell Global Network. Amen. So once again, we're here today to do the right thing. Um, today, as you can see, I'm dressed in suit and tie today. I'm um, coming from a funeral. I really don't like funerals. Um, I guess the same can be said about you too. I really don't like going to funerals. I know what the Bible says about funerals, but I really don't like going to them. I, um, whether the, the deceased is saved or not, whether it's a home going, I really don't like them because I don't like saying goodbye. Just something about funerals. I, I don't like to say goodbye, so I'm coming from a funeral today. Um, I know what the Bible says about funerals, and while we're here, before I get into the text, let's just take a look at that. Let's see what the Bible has to say about funerals. If you would open up to Ecclesiastics uh, 7 chapter, the first to the third verse, you're going to find these readings here. I was kind of pondering around, uh, I was kind of pondering on this while I was sitting um, in the funeral today. It says, a good reputation or character is more valuable than most expensive perfume. The one that, and the one, or should I say, the day that one dies is better than the day that one is born. <clears throat> now that's interesting right there. The day that you die is more important than the day that you was born. It's more important than the day that you was born, as if to say that the ending is always or should be better than the beginning. Okay, we celebrate your birth, we celebrate the fact that you was born, but um, more importantly, what have you done since you've been here that will have an impact on your ending? So, so what Solomon is saying here, what I hear him saying here, is that the ending should always be better than the beginning. The ending is what's most important. The ending tells the story, okay? It tells the story. So he's saying that the day that one dies is better than the day that one is born. It is better to spend time at funerals than festivals. As much as I don't like funerals, what Solomon is saying here, it's better to actually spend time at funerals than to spend time at parties. Something about funerals when we're sitting there and we're looking at the deceased, uh, it causes you to think really causes you to think about some things. Uh, that's the one time that uh, God really has our undivided attention. Whether you're saved or whether you're not saved, God really has your undivided attention at a funeral because one thing we all have in common, whether we choose to believe God or not, one day we're all going to die. One day, if God delays his coming, we're all going to be stretched out in the, in the front of the church in a coffin. So that's the one thing that it causes us to really think about. And so for that reason, he said, it's better to spend time at funerals than at parties. When I'm partying, God can't really get my attention. When everything is okay and everything is fine, I'm doing my own thing, God really doesn't have my undivided attention. But when I go to funerals, it causes me to think. Let's go further. It says, for, it says, for you are going to die. That's inedible. You are going to die one way or the other. You are going to die. Nobody's been, nobody is going to spend eternity here on earth. And those are some of the things that going to a funeral will cause you to think about that one day I'm going to die. And when that day get here, what do I have to look forward to? I was talking to a young lady, we, we kind of got, a, it wasn't a debate, it was more, more of a discussion. Um, she found it hard to believe that God would send people to hell. 
that God would send people to hell. Well, I corrected her, no, uh, God doesn't send people to hell. Our choices is what sends us to hell. It's because we choose not to believe. It's because we choose not to repent. That's why we go to hell. So then her next question was, uh, is there really a hell? When I die, am I really going to hell? Or, uh, or you know, who's to say that there is a hell? Who's to say that there is a heaven? So for the sake of argument, she asked me a question. She said, well, Ronnie, do you really know of anybody that have actually died and come back to life and told you that there was a heaven and there was a hell? And as I thought about it, my answer was simply no. Now, I know what the Bible says about hell. I know the story about Lazarus the rich man and Lazarus. I know the story about that, but personally, I don't know anybody that have died and come back and told me what they've actually seen. I've read the book. I've read the book by, uh, by I believe it was Baxter. I, I read the book, uh, Divine Revelation of Hell, but personally, I can't, personally, nobody has come back and told me that there was actually a heaven or a hell. So her question was, well, then how do we really know? How do we really know then? And, 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 and uh, what if all of this thing that the Bible is teaching us and telling us about heaven and hell is actually true or not? And my question was, um, I mean, and my answer was, actually, really don't know. I believe. Now, I believe in heaven and hell. I may not have witnessed nobody have come back and told me anything, but I believe that um, there is a heaven and there is a hell. But for the sake of argument, what I told her was this. Okay, let's assume that you are correct. Let's assume that you're correct. And we die. And we swap time for eternity. We quit the walks of this life. And then we find out that once we did, we go back to being whatever it was before we were born. And that's nothing. I can't recall anything. I can't recall anything prior to the day that I was born. I had no feelings, I had no memories, I had no emotions, I had nothing. I, I, I can't recall anything. Whatever it was, I was just whatever, nothing. So then let's say that we die, we go back to being nothing. You wouldn't have anything to lose. I wouldn't have anything to lose. But then what if, what if there was something to this word. What if those people that went to church weren't crazy all the time? What if there was actually a heaven and a hell? I wouldn't want to find out too late that uh, the word of God was actually true. I wouldn't want to be down in hell lifting up my eyes and realizing that uh, the preacher was right, my mother was right, the missionary was right. I wouldn't want to take that chance and go down there and find out that I was wrong because I choose not to believe. So what I told her, beloved, I told her, since I choose to believe, I'm going to walk according to the statues of Jesus Christ and I'm going to live my life the way God says live it because I believe in life insurance. Now, if I get down there and find out that uh, all of this was just talk and fairy tale, I have nothing to lose. But if I went down there and found out that there was some truth to this Bible, there was truth to what was being preached, I still wouldn't have anything to lose because I lived my life accordingly. And I want to hear God, I want to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So what I was telling her, I can't live my life and, and, and uh, get to the end of it and by the roll of a dice determine whether or not heaven or hell is real. I want my bases covered. I can't go 50-50. Either way it go, because I choose to believe God and I choose to walk up right before God, either way it go, when I quit the walks of this life, I have no problem one way whatsoever. So why take the chance? Why take the chance? and saying, I don't think it is, and get there and find out that it really is. Why not take out some life insurance and trust God and walk up right before God and do those things that are pleasing to him so that if it is, then you're covered. You're covered. So when we got done with the conversation, I believe I got through to the young lady to uh, just let her see that, hey, no matter what, opportunity, sir. Your opportunity, ma'am, is today. 
today, in the day that you hear my voice, don't you harden your heart. I'm talking to somebody here today because I wasn't planning to go this direction today. But God is saying to somebody, in the day that you hear my voice, don't you harden your heart. Now, I used to think that meant that in the day that you hear it, you better repent and get it together because if you didn't, there would not be a tomorrow. But I'm finding out, beloved, as I continue to read more and God begins to reveal things to me more and more, that what that verse, verse means also, it can very well mean that. Let me say that. It can mean that that uh, if you don't get it together today, then there's a possibility that there may not be a tomorrow. But also, you can hear the word of God, reject it, and you can live for another 10, 15, 20 years, but the word of God will not have that same pull. It will not have that same tug on you as it did the day that you heard it when God was trying to get your attention. So in the day that you hear my voice and you feel that tug, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody out there in the visible audience, somebody in the TV audience, somebody, you feel a tug from God, and God has been tugging on you and pulling on you and trying to get your attention. Don't you run from that. Don't you run. Don't you turn that dial. Don't get uneasy now. Stay with me. So then he says here that while you still got time to think, God has something for you to do. He said that sorrow is better than laughter. For sadness has a refining. It has a refining influence on us. It will refine us the way we think. Sometimes we need to stop laughing long enough to see exactly what's going on uh, uh, around us. Stop laughing long enough to see what God is trying to say to us. Stop partying all the time and sit down somewhere in a quiet place and see what God is trying to tell you. But every time God tries to get our attention, we find more parties to go to. We find more. We, we find. We try to find more parties. We try to. Uh, we turn to the alcohol, or we call our friends and our, our buddies. What's going on? I'm bored. God is trying to get you to a place where He can just sit you down, so He can minister and talk to you, because the direction that you're headed in is 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 uh, is death. The Bible says that sin, when it is finished, it brings about death. So every time God sends a little trouble your way, you try and find ways out of the trouble, but God uses trouble to get our attention. Who am I talking to out there? God is using trouble to try to get your attention. You keep fighting the trouble. Every time trouble comes, every time sorrow comes, you try and find ways to get out of it. But God is trying to get your attention, sir. He's trying to get your attention, ma'am. So while I was at the funeral today, I, I want to say this is what I heard. I, I stand to be corrected, but I want to say this is what I heard. Um, the preacher was saying concerning the deceased that the last time he had seen the deceased is he was preparing to get things together. He was preparing himself to come back to church. He was preparing him, himself to get his life back together. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with preparing because everything starts with preparing. The only bad thing about preparing is not being prepared when the day comes. Let me say that again. The only bad thing about preparing is not being prepared when the day comes. Now, I can't say one way or the other whether he had actually prepared or whether, or, uh, whether he was prepared or whether he was preparing. I don't know. But the thought that jumps out to me was, is this, that at some point we've got to go from being, we've got to go from preparing to being prepared. God is looking for a prepared people. And if you're constantly preparing, you're going to miss it. Going to the lesson text today, we're going to go into the Gospel of St. Luke, 17th chapter, and the 31st verse, you're going to find these words. It says that in that day, he which is upon the housetop and have stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. Now, what is Jesus saying here? If you're on the housetop, if you're on the roof, and you're on the roof and you're there, and, you, and then you realize that you still have other things that you need to go down and get. He said, forget about those things. He said, he said, forget about those things. Stay where you are. 
Then it goes on to say, it says, um, and it's in the latter part of that verse, it says this, and he that is in the field, let him not return back. If you're in the field, don't turn around and go back because, after, because you realize that you forgot something. If you're on the housetop, don't go back downstairs and get it because you realize that you forgot something. What Jesus is saying here, all of those things are, are uh, all of those things, let me back up some here. All of those things are referencing preparing. At some point, it was okay to go up and down, up and down from the top of the rooftop down to the house to gather things. It was a process. But now what Jesus is saying that once you're up there now, you better stay there. In other words, you've got to go from preparing to being prepared. Because in this particular chapter, Jesus was talking to them about the rapture. We know that the rapture is not in the Bible. We know that the rapture is not in the Bible, but we call it a rapture because we know that when Jesus comes back, his second coming, when, as soon as he comes back, he's going to come back. And when he comes back, the Bible says that those that are dead in Christ shall rise first. They're going to come out of their grave. And we, which I remain, we're going to be caught up with the Lord in the twinkling of an eye. He says in prior chapters, in the uh, few verses prior to that, in the 25th verse, he went on to say that when the Son of Man coming, it's going to be like lightning that flashes from one end of the sky to the other. That's just how quick this thing is going to be. And if you are finding, and, and if you're constantly preparing yourself, when he comes, you're going to miss it because you're, constant, because you're in preparing mode and not prepared. While you're on the housetop, you better stay on the housetop because the minute you think you got enough time to run down and grab something else, the rapture would have been taking place just that quick and you would have missed him. So then how does that apply to us today? Those of you that are saved, stay saved. Whatever God has called you to do, do it. You better be found doing it. It's not a time of getting ready, but if you're saved, you better stay saved. If you're not saved, you better get saved. This is not the time. We are not living in a time now where you can be decisive, straddling the fence. How close can I come to sin without actually sinning? We're in a day and time now where God is wrapping this thing up and he's going to do a quick work and you can't be and and and, uh, and you can't afford to be straddling the fence. You can't afford to uh be preparing yourself. You need to be prepared now and all that you don't have, all that you didn't get, all that you did not get, then you need to leave it behind. I'm leaving those things behind me. And you've got to press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Okay? So, um, told them, don't, don't turn back. Don't turn back. My thought today, my thought today would be escape and don't look back. Escape and don't look back. I'm reminded of the story of Lot. Reminded of the story of Lot. Let's just go there. Let's just go to Genesis, the 19th chapter, and the 12th verse. Um, I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, we know, we know actually what was taking place here. God had sent the angels down there to destroy the city because of the sin that was there, and not only the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, but those that uh, uh, of the plains around the city. And God gave the angels specific instructions. He said, go down there. I want you to destroy the city. But uh, before you destroy the city, I want you to get Lot and his family out of there. I want you to get Lot and his family out of there. So then the angels come down there in the 15th verse. Um, and they begin to warn Lot of what was going to take place. And tell Lot, look, start preparing. Start preparing. Go and try to prepare and get everything that you can and get out of this city because this place is about to be destroyed. Beloved, I come to tell you that just like it was in the days of Lot, that God is getting ready to destroy this place. He's getting ready to destroy this place. This is not a this is not a doom. I'm not here to pronounce doom and gloom on America or doom and gloom over the world. I'm just here simply as God's spokesman to let you know that God's word is true and that this place that we're living in that we call home one day is going to be destroyed. 
and you're going to have to make up your mind that uh, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be ready because when God come back, I want to be ready. I don't want to be one of those that uh, get left behind. I don't want to be one of the people that when God come back found me not doing what I'm supposed to do. I don't want to be one of those uh, that was straddling the fence and didn't take things serious. And, and when God came and left, I was still left down here. I don't want to be one of the ones that's going to be walking around here during the times of destruction. But I want to be one of the ones that was prepared and ready. So when God said, uh, well done, I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou good and faithful servant. I want to read. The, I want to read this uh, in Genesis uh, nineteen and twelve. It says, "And the two men, which were the angels, asked a lot, have you uh, any others here in Sodom, your son-in-laws and your sons and your daughters, whomever you have in this city? Uh, take them out of here, Lot. I'm giving you an opportunity to prepare yourself. Gather up everything that you can." That's what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with preparing. God has given us an opportunity. Prepare yourself. This is actually a season of preparing. And then he goes on to say the 13th verse. It says, um, in the 13th verse, it says, for we are here to destroy this place because of the outcry, because of the judgment. God has sent judgment. And he's going to destroy the place. And God always sent warning. He always sent a warning. Always send warning before he sends destruction. I'm going to say this. What's interesting about that, what I wanted to bring up, but, but my time is just about up. What I wanted to bring out uh, about that story is that Lot, God was concerned about Lot because of the relationship he had with Abraham, because of the covenant with Abraham. And I just want to encourage all the Abrahams out there. You keep praying for your loved ones. You keep praying for their deliverance. You keep walking up right before God. And you never know what God is doing on the other end. He's going to save that unsaved loved one. He's going to save that son. He's going to save that daughter. He's going to save that family member and rescue them out of destruction like he did Lot. Time is wrapping up. Time is wrapping up. And if you're sitting out there now and you heard this message and I had no intentions on going in the direction that I was uh, in, I mean, in the direction that I went in today. But if you're sitting out there and you heard the message and you know this message has done something for you and you know beyond the shadow of your doubt, preacher, if I die today, if the Lord was to come today, would you go to heaven? I can't answer that question for you. Only you can answer that question. If God was to come today, will you be ready? Honestly. If your answer is no, then I want you to repeat after me. Because, uh, because you can be saved right there where you are. I want you to repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart today and I ask forgiveness for all my sins. Jesus, I want to thank you for dying for my sins and forgiving me through the shed it through through your shedded blood on the cross. Please take away all the sinful old things in my heart that defile me. Feel me and replace me with your Holy Spirit with good things that you desire to grow in my life. Wash me and make me white as snow. Lord, I confess with my heart, I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that you died, raised from the dead, and saved me. In Jesus' name, amen. And just like that, you are saved. I am I am excited for you. The Bible said that the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Um, I would encourage you to find you a Bible-believing church. Go find your Bible-believing church. Get in church. This is only the beginning. God's got something planned for you. If you don't have a church, come visit me at my church. I'll be glad to see you. Be glad to shake your hand and we can rejoice and fellowship together over your salvation because of what God has done for you. But until we meet together and come back together again, I want to encourage you to do the right thing and let people know what God has done for you.
Let them know what you've done for you. And do the right thing. God bless you. Amen. This is Thomas Hitman Hearn, and you're watching Bell Global Network. What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Vicky Winans, and you're watching Bell Global Network. My name is Mike Duggan, and I'm watching the Bell Global Network. Hey, keep it locked. It's your boy, D. Hattie, watching the Bell Global Network. You know how it is. Hi, I'm Charlie Langton, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. Hi, this is Martha Reeves, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. Hi, everybody. I'm telling you, everything that happened to me that was good, God did it. I'm Evelyn Turrentine, AG, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. This is Pastor D. Alexander Bullock of Preachers of Detroit, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. This is Bishop Edgar Van of Second Ebenezer Church in Detroit, Michigan, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. Hi, I'm Bernadette Stannis. You know me best as Thelma from the TV show Good Times, and you are watching Bell Global Network. Hi, this is Thomas Hitman Hearn, and you're watching Bell Global Network. What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Vicky Winans, and you're watching Bell Global Network. My name is Mike Duggan, and I'm watching the Bell Global Network. Hey, keep it locked. It's your boy, D. Hattie, watching the Bell Global Network. You know how it is. Hi, I'm Charlie Langton, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. Hi, this is Martha Reeves, and you're watching Bell Global Network. Hi, everybody. I'm telling you, everything that happened to me that was good, God did it. I'm Evelyn Turrentine, AG, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. This is Pastor D. Alexander Bullock of Preachers of Detroit, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. This is Bishop Edgar Van of Second Ebenezer Church in Detroit, Michigan, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. Hi, I'm Bernadette Stannis. You know me best as Thelma from the TV show Good Times, and you are watching Bell Global Network. My name is Mike Duggan, and I'm watching the Bell Global Network. Hey, keep it locked. It's your boy D. Hattie, watching the Bell Global Network. You know how it is. Hi, I'm Charlie Langton, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. Hi, this is Martha Reeves, and you're watching the Bell Global Network.